الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلي الله وسلم على سيدنا محمد طه الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته My name is Murtada I'm your little brother in Islam I'll have the pleasure of being here during the summer and benefiting from you بإذن الله تعالى as a reminder to myself and you we are not distinguished over here as Muslims uh, by the color of our skin or by who is doing the speaking and who is doing the listening or where we're from. Rather, the matter is as Allah Ta'ala said in the Quran, Inna akramakum indallahi atqakum. So I ask Allah Ta'ala to make us among the righteous and pious and to make us from among those who want for our brothers and sisters righteousness and piety. Allahumma ameen. Insha'Allah Ta'ala, we're going to start today uh, explaining the book An Advice from the Heart to the Child, authored by the great scholar and wali, saint, and prolific author, Abdul Rahman ibn al Jawzi. This great scholar, Rahimahullah, is a Hanbali scholar. That means he followed the madhab of Al-Imam Al-Mujtahid Ahmad ibn Hanbal Rahimahullah And one of the things that sets this scholar apart from many other scholars of Al-Islam is how prolific of an author he was Ibn al-Jawzi, not to be confused with Ibn al-Jawziyyah Ibn al-Jawziyyah is not who we're talking about here And perhaps we would only talk about Ibn al-Jawziyyah in the context of warning against him. Ibn al-Jawzi is a top scholar, a Sunni. He wrote 500, around more than 500 works. And this book, which we translated as an advice from the heart to the child, the Arabic name is Laftatul Kabidi, Ila Nasihatil Walad. This book is one of those 500 books. And this book, he wrote early on in his scholarly in his scholarly career. He had written about a hundred books when he wrote this book. So we know then that this was early on in his career in which he wrote this book. And as the name suggests, Laftatul Kabidi ila Nasihatil Walad, this book or this advice was written for one of his sons. But this doesn't prevent us from benefiting from these advices. Because from one perspective, he is writing as a father to his child and he is advising his child. So if we are parents in this room, his advice should guide us as parents as to what we should be advising our children with. You will realize, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, throughout the book, the scholar does not instruct his child to uh, get a bigger salary, nor to make it into Harvard, Princeton, those institutions. This child on um, buying houses and flipping those houses, or to buy the most expensive. Rather, we're going to see what he advises his child with. And so us, if we're parents in this room, these are the same advices which, would, which we should be ingraining in our own children. And then on the other hand, the children in this room, they would see what is expected from them as Muslim children. That maybe in their own lives, since they made it up to this point, whether they be 13, 14, 15, or older than that, maybe they didn't hear of these advices. Maybe the things that they were pushed to are not what this scholar is pushing his own child to. And then it would fix their perspective on life. It would make them realize, or perhaps it would be a reminder for them if they already know as to what their goals should be in this life. So, a Sheikh Abu Faraj, Abdul Rahman ibn al Jawzi, who died in the year 597 of Al Hijra, said, Bismillahir Rahman al Rahim, meaning, I start by the name of Allah, the merciful to the believers and non believers in this life and the merciful one to the believers specifically in the hereafter, in the afterlife. So when we say Bismillah, 
This means I begin with the name of Allah. And this is known as the Basmalah. When someone says Basmalah, that means to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. He says Bismillah and Allah is ar-Rahman. Again, ar-Rahman, the one who is merciful to the believers and non-believers in this life. As is clear to you, you can see all around you that among the mercies of Allah to the believers as well as the non-believers in this life is the fact that, and it's especially a mercy on a day like this, they both enjoy cold water, for example. And they both enjoy health, for example. And other than that, both the believers and non-believers in this life, they enjoy from the various mercies of Allah Ta'ala. As for his name, Ta'ala ar rahim this means that he is the merciful one to the believers only in the hereafter. This means that after death, Allah is not merciful to any of the accountable non-believers. So anyone who dies as a pubescent person and they were sane and they heard the call of Islam and they died without having become a Muslim, Allah Ta'ala will not be merciful to them after death. As a reminder, you all know this, that the call of Islam here refers to them having heard in a language they understand, La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. So if they heard this and they understood this, they are considered to have, uh, they are considered to be among those who heard the call of Islam. So it's not uh, a condition for them to have gone to a seminar about Islam, to learn about the five pillars of Islam, or more than that, to then be considered as people who have heard the call of Islam. And the proof of this is that the Messenger of Allah, as you know, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he sent letters to the different rulers around the globe, that's what he suffi sufficed with when he called them to Islam. With the testimonies, he told them, bear witness that there is no one to be worshipped except Allah, and bear witness that I am the Messenger of Allah. And so they were considered to have heard the call of Islam. And the Messenger of Allah, in those very same letters, he told them that if you reject this, then you have... Uh, then you will incur upon yourselves the punishment from Allah Ta'ala. So the Messenger of Allah did not extrapolate in those letters which he sent to the different rulers as to the tafasil, the uh, explanation, the detailed explanation of what Islam matters, uh, of what the Islamic matters are, excuse me. So again, as a reminder, that it is thus unlawful after having known this, it is unlawful Islamically to say to those accountable non-Muslims who died Rahimahullah or may Allah have mercy on them. And this is the case even if they were helpful to the non-Muslims. Even if they supported the cause of the Palestinians. Even if they used to give a lot of charity to Muslims. We don't have the right to say may Allah forgive them or may Allah grant them paradise for such people. None None of the accountable non-Muslims will enter paradise. And this is a reminder that's important, especially nowadays. Many people would say, may Allah have mercy on them about someone who they know Allah will not be merciful to. As mentioned in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَغْفِرُ أَن يُشْرَكَ بِهِ وَيَغْفِرُ مَا دُونَ ذَلِكَ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ so one needs to be in control of their emotions. Even if they feel that they used to love these non-Muslims because of their goodness to non-Muslims. And sometimes you will see that these people who died, they're actually not even known for their goodness to, non -Mus uh, to Muslims. It's not like Kobe Bryant was a supporter of the Palestinian cause. It's not like he donated money to then be open, to open with that money a, a masjid. Yet, subhanAllah, because of our situation being far away from loving the Messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and his companions radiyallahu anhum and his wives radiyallahu anhunna and the righteous and pious who followed them, instead of filling our hearts with loving such people who deserve our love, our hearts are filled with statistics about basketball players and soccer players and the biographical details of entertainers 
Subhanallah ta'ala. So if we're not careful, we would be falling into these serious mistakes. May Allah protect us. And as a benefit and uh, as a uh, tidbit to perhaps encourage you if you're not already or to push you if you are already pursuing Arabic studies, let's uh, delve into those two names of Allah, Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman, how many letters are there? Bidun alif lam, without the alif and lam. If we say Rahman, how many letters are there? Can you tell me, Zainuddin? Can anyone tell me, Rahman, how many letters? Rahman, Ra, Ha, Meem, Alif, Noon, right? We say Rahman. Yes, it's not written, the Alif, Tawila is not written, but it is five letters, Rahman. So are you with me? Five letters and Rahman. Bismillah Rahman, and then Rahim. And Rahim, how many letters do we have? Seven, Rahim, Ra, Ha, Ya, Meem, four. So Rahman, five letters, Rahim, four letters. This is an important detail. Because didn't we say that Ar-Rahman means the one who is merciful to the believers and the non-believers in this life, and the one who is merciful to the believers only in the hereafter? Look at the vast meaning, right? When it, uh, that is entailed with the name of Allah, Ar-Rahman, which has five letters. Whereas Ar-Rahim has four letters, and we said it means the one who is merciful to the believers in the hereafter. So the meanings are less, just like the numbers of letters are less. And this is a qaida, a maxim if you'd like. Ziyadatul mabani tadullu ala ziyadatil ma'ani. That when the base of the word is longer or quite simply if there are more letters to the base of the word this refers to more meanings encompassed by that word both of them rahman and rahim come from the root rahima rahamim but one of them rahman has one extra letter which the other one rahim does not have and we explained what this entails the arabic language is absolutely beautiful and that is an understatement Subhanallah. May Allah give us the tawfiq to pursue learning it. Ameen. So he starts with the basmalah, which is to say, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Just like to say, La ilaha illallah, this is called what? When we say, La ilaha illallah, this is known as at tahleel, right? La ilaha illallah is at tahleel. And come on, you know this. Just like when we say, Allahu Akbar, this is called, people go, takbir, right? And when we say subhanallah, this is known as a tasbih. And we say, when, we, when we say la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah, this is known as al hawqalah. And when a Muslim passes away, we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. This is known as al istirja'. Al istirja'. When we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, this is known as al istirja. So you would see, you would read in the biographical accounts of the Prophet's life, alayhi salatu wasalam, that among his good manners is that when a Muslim would die, kana yastirji'u lahum, that he used to do istirja for him, which is to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Let's mention some of the benefits of al basmala. Among them, and this is a reminder to you, that if one says it when entering the door of their house and closes their door, they say Bismillah upon entering the house and then closing the door, no devil would enter through that door. And this is whether it's a house or a shop or even a window. If you close a window while saying Bismillah, no devil would enter through that window. And it is also Sunnah to say the Basmalah when about to eat. And if, you forget to, and if you forget to eat it upon uh, when you start to eat and then remembered to say the basmalah while you are eating, you would say, you would say, can someone help me? If you forget to say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as you're about to eat and then in the middle of eating, what would you say? Do you know? If you don't know, it's okay. Bismillah awwalahu wa akhirahu. So one day a companion forgot to say it when beginning to eat and then he remembered while eating 
and said it, Bismillahi awwalahu wa akhirahu. And the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam smiled. And inshallah ta'ala, uh, yes, we missed out on seeing him smile in this life, but I ask Allah to make us among those who see him smile in our dreams and in a wakeful state before we die and in paradise bi iznillahi ta'ala. So the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu was salam smiled. And he was asked, Ya Rasulullah, why did you smile? So he mentioned that the devil started eating the food because that person did not begin with saying the basmala. And then once the basmala was mentioned, he puked out what he ate. So let's start off with saying the basmala upon entering our houses. If we don't do so, a devil would come in the house with you, but not only him. Then he would call out his friends from among the shayateen. He would say to them, come, we found a place to spend the night. Doesn't mean they're going to have a sleepover there, a mabit. Uh, he would spend some time in the night in the house. So let's be keen and make it a point that every time we go into our houses, we say the basmala, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And perhaps you yourselves have noticed sometimes when you enter a place, a sort of heaviness on your chest. And that is because of the fact that that house or that place is filled with devils. This is the case especially if you go into the house of the kuffar, the disbelievers in Allah. Or in the house of people who do not pray their prayers. Or in the house of people who engage in many sins throughout the day and night. And then when you would leave that house, you would feel a lightness in your chest, subhanAllah, as if a rock was lifted from you and you can breathe again. And this is no surprise considering the Messenger of Allah, considering that the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wasalam, said what means that the house in which the name of Allah is mentioned versus the house in which the name of Allah is not mentioned is like the difference between the one who is alive and the one who is dead. So other recommendations include to enter the house with the right foot and again to say Bismillah and to say Assalamu Alaikum to those people who are inside and even if you walk into your house and no one is there you would say Assalamu Alayna wa ala ibadillah salihin Likewise upon entering the masjid one would do so with their right foot and upon leaving it would be with the left foot and as for the bathroom, it's the opposite, as you know. One would enter with the left foot and would leave with the right foot. So the Imam, rahimahullah, started off with the basmala. And we explained its meanings. And he does so also in following the Qur'an. As the Qur'an, which has how many surahs are there in the Qur'an? Ya Hafidh al-Qur'an, how many surahs are in the Qur'an? Who knows? 114 surahs in the Qur'an. All of the surahs in the Qur'an start with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim except for one surah, that is Surah Al-Tawbah, also known as Al-Bara'ah because it begins with Bara'atum min Allahi wa Rasulihi. This is the only surah in the Qur'an that does not begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And if we were to read this surah from its beginning, we would not say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We would begin right away with saying Bara'atum min Allahi wa Rasulihi. However, if you're beginning from somewhere in the middle of the surah or later than that, you can start with saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Then the author, Rahimahullah, said, and his help, meaning the help of Allah, we seek. Praise be to the one who created the forefather Adam. So now he's saying praise be to, the, to Allah. Alhamdulillah. The one, Allah, is the one who created our forefather, Adam. And as we mentioned, when we say Alhamdulillah, this is known as Alhamdulillah. It is to thank Allah, our Lord, our Creator, for the many endowments He has bestowed upon us without any obligation upon Him to do so. Allah is our Creator and He is our owner. And He does with whatever He, he created, whatever He wills. Right there is your answer to some of the atheists with their feeble emotional arguments. Don't they say, oh, if God existed, then why are there handicapped people and things, emotional arguments without any mantiq, without any logic. And right there, by explaining Alhamdulillah, the Muslim knows the answer to that. Quite simply, Allah Ta'ala is our creator and he is our owner. And he does with whatever he owns, whatever he wills. 
just to bring it closer to your mind, this thawb, we say it's my thawb, right? I own it. Whether I donate it to someone or I sell it to someone, and if I had the sewing skills, which I don't, I would modify it and turn it into uh, izar maybe. None of you would stand up and say, how dare you do this to your thawb? Because you know it's my thawb, right? Allah Ta'ala is the owner of us and the owner of what we own. He is the owner of everything in reality. And he does with what he owns, whatever he wills. And he is not to be objected against. So Allah Ta'ala, our Lord, gave us health. And he gave us Islam, which is the greatest blessing. And many other blessings. By his generosity and mercy, without any obligation upon him. So when we say Alhamdulillah next time, let's have this meaning present in our hearts. And saying Alhamdulillah with our tongues, this is a recommended matter, meaning we are not forced, we are not obligated to say it, except for when. When do we have to say Alhamdulillah? When is that? The prayer, right? Because Al-Fatiha is among the arkan of the salah. So we say Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. That's when we have to say it. Other than that, if I'm walking around uh, or I'm thinking of a blessing that I have to say Alhamdulillah, this is recommended. And don't get it twisted. When I say recommended, as if, as if some people when they see recommended, it means scratch it off my list to do, of things to do. <laughs> That's not what it means. Recommended is a judgment in the religion and we should do it. Especially the people who are proud to be from the jama'ah of a Shaykh Abdullah al-Harari rahimahullah who applied the sunnah so much that those who were around him, they said as if he is a companion walking among us. Subhanallah. So the sunnah is not something we cross off our lists. The sunnah is something we rush towards, right? And are we going to let people who believe that Allah has body parts or that he moves around or other ugly things on a, beat us in this, in, in making it seem to the people that they are more staunch adherents to the sunnah? This, is, this would be embarrassing. Personally, it's embarrassing to think of that, all right? Something to think about. As for the, so this was the optional thanking of Allah. As for the obligatory thanking of Allah, as you know, it is to not use the endowments of Allah, the endowments given to us by Allah in disobeying Allah. So the endowment of the eye, one would show this obligatory thankfulness by not looking at the haram. And likewise with the tongue, one would not eat something haram and with the stomach, one would be thankful to Allah for this endowment by not consuming what is haram. And this obligatory thank thankfulness of Allah is uncommon nowadays. Many people, they say Alhamdulillah many times. If they say it correctly, we don't say Alhamdulillah, we say Alhamdulillah, right? They say this, good, it's a good deed, but this obligatory thank thankfulness of Allah, which is to not use the endowments of Allah in disobeying Allah, this is uncommon nowadays. And we ask Allah to make us among those who are truly thankful to Him for the many endowments He has given us. So let's remind one another about some matters which would help us to not use our endowments in disobeying Allah. Let's talk about some endowments. Can someone tell me one of the endowments of Allah upon them? Remember, Allah said, So tell me among some of the endowments. Afiyah, health, health is an endowment of Allah. Someone else? I can't, my hearing is bad, subhanAllah. Al-Iman, of course. Anything else? It's hot outside, I know some people are drowsy. Yes, Zain? Sight, okay. I'm not gonna keep you guys listing. <laughs> Sight, health, and other than that, the top of the list is Al-Iman, as you said, Shaykhi. So, we, think, we tend to think of these endowments, masalan, masalan sight, is one endowment of Allah. But really, 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 and think with me for a second, isn't it the case that if in one moment I can see, in the other moment, Allah who gave me the sight can also take away my sight? 
So the endowment of the eyes of sight, let's not just think it as one endowment. Rather, now let's start thinking of each moment in which I can see, this is one independent blessing from Allah. Does this, is this understandable? Likewise, I'm speaking now by the blessing of Allah, but the next moment in five minutes, I could be mute. So every moment in which I am able to speak, this is an independent blessing from Allah Ta'ala. So is it clear to us now that we cannot count the many blessings of Allah upon us? So this should make us shy from using those endowments and committing what is sinful. And likewise, if ever, not if, I mean it happens a lot to us, when the shaitan, when the shaitan encourages us to disobey Allah, we should remember that we cannot disobey Allah except through a blessing that Allah has given us. When shaitan whispers to us when we're in a store, oh, steal the chocolate bar, the cameras are not pointing at your angle and the shopkeeper is busy texting, so just take it. Can you steal without using your hand? No. Likewise, for any other sin, we cannot disobey Allah except through, through a ni'mah, a blessing that Allah has given us. So this also would remind us or would make us feel shy from disobeying Allah next time the shaitan whispers to us. And those who use their endowments, thirdly, third matter we should think about, which would encourage us from leaving off sins, is that those who use their endowments to sin, to disobey Allah, they would be prevented by Allah Ta'ala from benefiting from those endowments afterwards. Many times if we sin and sin and sin by again using an endowment that Allah has given us, Allah Ta'ala would take that endowment away from us. And that is the meaning of the verse. إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِقَوْمٍ حَتَّى حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ This means that Allah does not take away some endowments that He bestowed upon some of His creations except when they use those endowments to disobey Him. Sometimes we'll see a rich person using their wealth in disobeying Allah or their health in disobeying Allah or their good reputation. Having a good reputation, this is a blessing from Allah. These would be taken from such people because they use those endowments in disobeying Him, Ta'ala. And this is not the case, of course, for the pious person. The pious person who is inflicted with poverty or sickness, with other calamities, this is for an increase in rank, an increase in status or a deletion of sins. But if you see someone who is neglecting their obligatory prayers, or committing zina, or drinking alcohol, and then loses their wealth, this would be a punishment because of their lack of obligatory thankfulness to Allah. As for the pious person, someone who lives his life in obedience to Allah, their infliction with poverty or sickness is actually a good sign because they know that through this, their ranks would be elevated. And you know that the pious and righteous who preceded us, and those today as well, if they went through a long period of time without sickness, without losing any loved ones, um, without poverty, this is not something that would make them happy and say, oh, yay, I'm doing good. No, they would start crying. They would start crying because to them, living a life in obedience to Allah entails, you can't avoid being inflicted with hardships. So a pious person, if he's going through a week or two weeks, three weeks, a month, without any form of infliction, he's not even pricked by a thorn, he starts getting paranoid. SubhanAllah, am I doing everything I thought I was doing? All these good deeds that I'm doing, maybe I was insincere while doing them. He starts sweating and feeling sad and crying. SubhanAllah. These are matters I should think about and we should think about. Don't we love our wealth and health? So why would we obey a shaitan when he whispers to us to disobey Allah?
We need to remember that the one who gave us the power to move our hands can deprive us of this endowment. And that is Allah Ta'ala, our Lord, our Creator, the one who deserves our worship and who deserves our obedience. Also, we should remember that death can reach us at any time. How ugly it would be. How embarrassing. How vile. To die while doing something haram, like adultery. How awkward would your family members be? I don't want to say you. How awkward would this person's family members feel? This person died while they were watching something they're not supposed to watch. And doing something they're not supposed to do. And they died. And their family member walked in on them. And the screen was on. The video was still playing. And they're lying half naked. How awkward. How, how, what an ugly death that is. Subhanallah. Imagine the funeral. Someone comes to the family member and says, Fulan, rahimahullah, he died. How did he die? Uh, rahimahullah. How about... Uh, Fred Van Fleek, he got traded. Uh, what do you think about that? The Raptors should have kept him. He's not going to want to talk about that, right? They're going to, subhanAllah, and whatever, whatever they felt about that person before, whatever they thought about him as being pious and righteous, they see his end like that. That's their last memory of him, subhanAllah. What a devastating effect it would have. So may Allah grant us a good ending. And uh, by being clean... We're going to be winners. We're going to be confident. Whereas by being dirty, dirtying ourselves with sins, the person would be weak and paranoid. And paranoid. Do you guys know what paranoid means? The person is always looking over his shoulder. Is someone seeing me? Does someone know I did this? He always has this worry. Did I delete my browsing history? Uh, did, someone found, did someone watch me as I walked into the LCBO? Oh, Zaid is calling me. Did, did someone tell him I was talking smack about him yesterday? That's how the person, the sinner feels like, subhanAllah. Like the person who calls in sick for work when he's not sick, right? And then he leaves the house, he's going to be paranoid. Oh, is my boss here? And his boss calls him. Oh my God, did he see me walking around at the Jays game, for example? That's how the sinner is, subhanAllah. So let's be clean. Let's be winners. When we're honest, truthful, you will feel strong. You will walk around with confidence. Especially, inshallah ta'ala, as everyone in this room is either already or is working towards becoming a da'i, someone who is calling others to the religion of Allah. So if someone is referring to you as ustada or ustad or shaykh, the, the, you have a higher priority to fix your situation if it's not fixed already. So he said, Rahimahullah, praise be to the one who created the forefather, Adam, السلام, from soil. Our forefather, Adam, is the first human Allah created. There were no humans before him. Allah Ta'ala created Adam after the angels were created, as well as the jinn, as well as the heavens, and the earth, and paradise, and hellfire. Adam is the last kind of creation that Allah created. Allah Ta'ala ordered an angel to come down to earth and bring a handful of soil from uh, hard soil and soft soil and what's between them and from good soil and bad soil and what's between them and from the different colors of soil black, red, yellow, white and what's in between them. This angel with this soil came to paradise and mixed this soil with the water from the water of paradise. And the shape of Adam السلام, was created from that clay. When water and soil mixes, it becomes clay, as you know. And that's why we have different colors among human beings. And we have different personality types. Some people are very humble and smiling and soft, and others as if they are a walking fireball. All right? When the shape of Adam السلام, became dry, Allah Ta'ala ordered an angel to blow the soul into him. And the first thing he did السلام, was to sneeze at Chu. And the first thing he did was to say, Alhamdulillah. So Adam used to speak and communicate. Uh, and communicate through language, that is. He was not, 
using signs like the monkeys do or jumping around from tree to tree like monkeys do and how people here would like you to believe. And he lived السلام, in paradise for 130 years and for 870 years he lived on earth which is a total of 1,000 years. So he died السلام, when he was 1,000 years old and Hawa or Eve السلام, died one year after our master Adam. And he did not die until he saw 40,000 of his own offspring السلام. and as a high rank as a sign of the high rank of our master Muhammad السلام, as you know he is the best of Allah's creations he is the one whom we love more than ourselves more than our parents more than our own children subhanallah as a sign of the high rank of the Messenger of Allah, Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, Adam in paradise, inshallah ta'ala, he will be called Abu Muhammad. How many billions of people lived and live now who come from Adam? But what will he be called? Abu who? Abu Muhammad. Subhanallah. The author, Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, continues on to say about Allah Ta'ala that Allah created his offspring, meaning the offspring of Adam, from between the backbone and ribs. And this is, this reflects what came in Al-Quran Al-Kareem. Allah Ta'ala said, فَلْيَنْبُرِ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقَ خُلِقَ مِمَّا إِنْدَافِقَ this verse means, let the person ponder about how he, how he was created. He was created from sperm, which goes out from the spine of the male and the ribs of the female. This is a fact, whether today scientists believe it or not, whether they discovered it or not. Our religion, the haqiyah, the truthfulness of our religion, does not depend on some kafir in the science lab of the University of Toronto telling us that it's the truth. We know that it's the truth because Allah revealed it. And the Messenger, alayhi salatu wasalam, informed us that Islam is the truth. He, rahimahullah, goes on to say that Allah supported the clans this means he strengthened their relationships through kin and lineage. And he says that Allah bestowed upon me, he's talking about himself, bestowed upon me knowledge. So he is thanking Allah for having bestowed upon him knowledge. And this goes with the command of Allah, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ فَحَدِّثْ so definitely Ibn al-Jawzi, a wali, a scholar, a top scholar, as we emphasized early on, he is not boasting, he is not being prideful or arrogant. Rather, Allah Ta'ala ordered us in this verse to speak about the blessings that Allah bestowed us upon, that Allah bestowed upon us. If we do not fear insincerity, if the person fears a riya by speaking about the endowments of Allah upon him, then he would remain silent. And Allah knows what's in his heart. Allah knows that he is thankful to him. If he doesn't fear insincerity, then he would tell the people, Allah Ta'ala gave me a lot of halal money. Allah Ta'ala gave me an amazing wife, as many of you, I'm sure, say. And he would say, Allah Ta'ala uh, gave me amazing children. They're knowledgeable, pious, alhamdulillah. If he doesn't fear insincerity, he would say this. This was the ha among the habit of the righteous and pious as well. Even if they were wealthy, they were detached from the dunya. They were not attached to their wealth. What would they do? Because they were wealthy, they would wear nice clothes. Unlike what I'm wearing now. They would wear nice clothes. Why would they do this? First, as per what came in the verse. And secondly, which shows you uh, the intellect and the intelligence of these giants of Islam. Secondly, because when a poor person would see them wearing fine clothes, it would be an indication that these people have money 
And they would go to these scholars and ask them for help if they needed help. And they would benefit for, from their knowledge as well. So these are the two reasons that even the righteous and pious, if they had money, they would wear nice clothes to reflect that this is among the blessings of Allah upon them and to be an indicator to the poor people around them that they can come to them and ask for whatever needs they have. And he said, the author that is, that Allah bestowed upon him knowledge and what an endowment this is. Really, if, if you have many endowments that you can think about, of course, Islam is at the top of the list. But in this day and age as well, one of the biggest endowments we should be thankful for is the knowledge of the religion. And how did this knowledge reach us? It was through the great wali and scholar and imam, Abdullah al-Harari, rahmatullahi alayhi wa ala walidayhi. Whenever you make dua for him, also make dua for his parents. Uh, Shaykh Nusayba's dad told me that he loved this, that he loved this dua, for the person to make dua for his own parents. So, Shaykh Abdullah is among the greatest of blessings that Allah has bestowed upon us. May we work through the knowledge that he has given us, uh, he has rather passed down to us with sincerity. Ameen. And the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ That whomever Allah willed goodness for, he makes him knowledgeable in the religion. And from this, we understand that the opposite is also true. That whomever Allah did not will goodness for, Allah will not make him knowledgeable in the religion. Subhanallah. Then he goes on to say, Rahimahullah, and recognizing the truth that Allah bestowed upon Ibn al Jawzi many blessings among them, that he recognized the truth. And this was since his youth, as it's going to be mentioned later. And made my upbringing good. He is saying that Allah Ta'ala made his upbringing good. That in his youth, where a person during their youth, subhanAllah, they're so emotional, the hormones are firing up, they can go left, right, they, can, they would listen to the good or the bad. He is saying that in this time, which is difficult for many, Allah Ta'ala protected him. As you're going through it now, or as you're going to go through it, or as you went through it, your youth, this period between childhood and adulthood, your teenagers, if you want, the person is a little lost. They're searching for themselves. A person in that age is very impressionable. And many parents face uh, this problem with their teenagers. And it's in this specific time in a child's life or in a person's life, because they're not a child anymore, but they're not fully an adult. They are a teenager or a youth, that the presence of the parents are so much needed and emphasized upon. And you as a parent, if you're, not a, pa if you're a parent, your lack of presence in your child's life will not be compensated by money. The, the emptiness that you leave by being away from your child cannot be filled with money. So you should not be working 12 hours a day or even more than that. Spend quality time with your children. What's really the purpose of working 12 hours a day? Okay, to make more money. But for what? That extra money was made by sacrificing what? By sacrificing quality time with your children. And even if you did make that extra money, because you left that void in their life which could not be filled by money, where's that money gonna go? Either the child ends up in rehab or in prison, so that money is going to go towards bailing them out or towards funeral costs. A parent who neglects spending quality time with their children in order to make more money, they're going to lose their child and chances are that extra money that they made is going to be gone anyways to pay for the consequences that they are a cause of. And don't, uh, please do not be offended by what I'm saying. I am not doubting any of your uh, qualities or capacities as parents. This is a simple reminder. The person benefits from reminders. And it's a reminder for myself as well. 
Now, subhanAllah, both the mother and father uh, work more than eight hours a day. This is common. And when they come home, do you think they ask their child, how was their day? What do they need? Uh, were they bullied at school? Do they need help with their homework? No, they are so tired. They just lay on their bed and they fall asleep. And then next day, the same, the same routine. SubhanAllah. So who is going to raise the child if it's not the parents? Well, there's many people who are ready. There's many things that are ready to take your spot, including TikTok, including YouTube, including uh, Blippi, right? Including Peppa Pig. Are you really going to replace yourself with these and other bad options? And haven't you guys seen on YouTube that video of the people who are dying? They're asked, you know, what are your regrets in life? What are the things that you regret? Old people, right? There's an interviewer, they ask them, what do you regret most in life? None of them, if I'm not wrong, none of them said, oh, I didn't get that promotion. Or, oh, I didn't buy the newest Cadillac. Or, oh, I didn't buy the mansion that I wanted. No, most of them, they said, I regret not spending enough time with my family. So our youth, they need our help. And they need us to give them a chance. They need us to help them. And when you see a youth, when I see a youth coming to the musalla, even if they're disturbing us with their loud voice or laughing, let's be patient. Let's be patient with them. We'd rather them laughing here and joking here in a place where they're safe, surrounded by us, than laughing and joking around a couple of kuffa or ignorant Muslims, right? We should not repel our youth from coming here. If there's an activity organized, one of them comes late, we shouldn't wipe the floor with him in front of everyone. Ah, oh, you're late. We should call you Mr. Late. No, if you're doing this in front of people, do you think he's going to come back? No. We need to address matters appropriately and wisely. Because the way we address issues, we're either going to repel someone or make them our most loyal supporter. Then he says, Rahimahullah, and gave me children by whose existence I hope to earn a vast reward. Uh, Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, he is thanking Allah for the children he has given him. By whose existence he hopes for a high reward. And how is that? Well, first of all, by having children, we would be obeying the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who said, تَنَاكَحُوا تَكَاثَرُوا فَإِنِّي مُبَاهِنْ بِكُمُ الْأُمَمَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ he ordered us, get married, have children. I will look at your numbers with pride on the Day of Judgment. Secondly, we would be rewarded by having a good intention that through children, we would bring up someone who is a believer in La ilaha illallah. Because of you having a child, the number of Muslims would increase, not only your own family members. And then when we die, our rewards would be cut, except for three things, as you know. And one of them is a child which would benefit us through their dua after our passing. So that's why Ibn al-Jawzi, he is thanking Allah for blessing him with children, by whom he hopes to attain a vast reward. Then the author, rahimahullah, mentioned the verse from the Qur'an. رَبِّ جَعَلْنِي مُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِي رَبَّنَا وَتَقَبَّلْ دُعَاءَ رَبَّنَا رَبَّنَا اغْفِرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيَّ وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَوْمَ يَقُومُ الْحِسَابِ These are verses 40 to 41 of Surah Ibrahim, which mean, O oh Lord, make me one who performs their prayer regularly, and also make my offspring among those who perform their prayer regularly. O oh our Lord, Accept my supplication. O oh, our Lord, forgive me. Forgive my parents. Here by parents, it's our master Adam and Hawa who are meant. Ibrahim's parents in this verse refer to Hawa and Adam. And forgive the believers on the day of presenting uh, the presentation of the deeds. And among what's mentioned in this verse is Ibrahim salam making dua for Allah to forgive the believers from the males and the females. And this, is, uh, this has a great secret for us to say, Rabbi ghafir li walil mu'minina wal mu'minat, or Rabbi ghafir li mu'minina wal mu'minat. The great secret or the blessing or the reward that one would have by saying this 
Once they know of this reward, they would not let their tongue dry out from saying this. And that is that the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam said that the one who asks Allah for the forgiveness of the believers, Allah will give him an equal reward to the number of believers. So imagine from the time of Adam alayhi salam until now, how many believers were there and are there? So with this short sentence, Rabbi ghafir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat, you can just imagine the billions and billions of reward you would get. And don't be shocked at this. Allah Ta'ala, our Lord, is the one who rewards the little we do with a lot. Subhanallah. But don't let the shaitan trick you with this benefit and tell you, oh, forget the five daily prayers. Just say, Rabbi ghafir lil mu'minina wal mu'minat ten times a day. No. The most reward a Muslim would get from any deed is from the reward of the prayers during their day. And the prayer is an obligation. We cannot skip out on it or leave it out without an excuse. Then he said, Rahimahullah, thereafter, when I knew with certainty the honor of marriage and seeking children, for sure it's an honorable matter to get married and to have children. Don't let today's society fool you into thinking, oh, let me do me, uh, single life, all of that garbage. He said, after I knew with certainty the honor of marriage and seeking children, I finished reciting the whole Quran and asked Allah to grant me not one, not two, not three. How many children? Ten children. He asked Allah to grant him ten children. Allahu Akbar. I wonder if his wife was listening to that dua when it was being made. <laughs> marriage is beautiful, subhanAllah. If we know how to deal with marriage, it will bring a lot of happiness and benefits. And in short, it normally depends on the man. The making or the breaking of the marriage depends mostly on the man. If the man wants to make it easy, it will be easy. If the man and wife had an argument at night, it will be mostly up to the man to take the step either for them to go to bed happy or to go to bed angry. He's going to be the one that's needed to go to his wife and say, Babe, I'm sorry, you know, forget about it. Here, I made you chamomile tea, you know, inshallah ta'ala, tomorrow's another day. That's, that's the step usually the man will need to take. And marriage is not going to be perfect. It's going to have ups and downs as the cliche goes. But you can have perfect moments. When you leave the house, but you tell your spouse, I love you. Thanks for everything you do. I'm proud of you. This is a perfect moment. When you send a text in the middle of the day, I miss you. This is a perfect moment. When you leave a note in one of the drawers, she usually opens and closes saying, I love you kisses and hugs. This is a perfect moment. So you can increase your number of perfect moments throughout your day and inshallah ta'ala this will lead to a good life. The Messenger of Allah said alayhi salatu wasalam that among the best endowments that Allah bestows upon the man is to have a good wife. And likewise the opposite that among the best endowments that Allah bestows upon the woman is a good husband. Then Ibn al-Jawzi rahimahullah said that after he recited, he did a khatim of the Qur'an. What did he do? He made dua for ten children and Allah granted him these ten children. And this is one of the benefits that the person who finishes the khatim of the Qur'an, reads the Qur'an from Al-Fatiha to An-Nas, that his dua would be accepted. And Allah did indeed give him ten children. And inshallah ta'ala, Next time we get together, if we're alive by the will of Allah, we'll talk about uh, what happened to these children and to whom was this message directly uh, directed to specifically from among his children. And we're going to meet of the advice. Let's end as we honor our beloved. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim. اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رب اغفر لي وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات وجز الله محمدا عنا خيرا